Our podcast talks about the latest trends in the worlds of cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Crypto and Blockchain Talk. Today with me, I have Forbes.com writer Ben Jessel. Hello, Ben. Hey, Aviva, how are you doing? Hey, really great. And we're going to be talking about ETFs. And ETFs are exchange traded funds. And we have done a podcast before about ETFs when they were first really raising their head above the parapet. And the SEC was considering crypto ETFs. Now, when we talk about crypto and blockchain, we, of course, and then we talk about ETFs. So crypto and blockchain and ETFs together. There are two things we're going to be discussing during this podcast. One of them are ETFs, which involve the use of cryptocurrencies. And the other topic is going to be ETFs, which are using blockchain. How does that feel, Ben? That's great. I think it's a great way to divide the world. (laughs) Excellent, because everything else has been divided. Why not ETFs? Okay, so why don't we first start with a definition? So, Ben, what exactly is an ETF? So let's get start even prior to ETFs. Oh, so, goody, a story. Yeah, I love it. Go right back to the beginning, not quite to people trading rocks or something like that. But we had these kind of ideas of uh, notions of mutual funds back in the day. And the idea of that was to provide exposures to investors across a range of different stocks or shares or bonds. So to give you an example, if you wanted to get exposure to NASDAQ 100, for example, Um, Before mutual funds, you'd have to go and buy a hundred different stocks yourself and then manage the weighting that you had on those stocks by buying and selling them, which is obviously very difficult to do. So mutual funds came along and said, look, you know, we're going to actually have a manager that is going to pool everyone's money and then give you a fraction of that. So you don't have to invest in all of the stocks yourself. You just have to have an exposure to them, a synthetic exposure. Now, that was very successful, but the challenge you have with something like a mutual fund is it's quite expensive because you have a manager that is managing this exposure for you. And then also there were some challenges around getting out of the position of a mutual fund as well. And then sometimes fees are front loaded, which means you have to pay a lot of fees up front before you actually start getting to the good stuff. Now, what started to appear really in 1993 was the first one that emerged, was this notion that they could wrap these mutual funds in a vehicle which made them a lot more easy to trade into, trade out of, and had lower fees. So the idea of an exchange traded fund is that it actually does trade on on a stock exchange. And the value of it, rather than being calculated at the end of the day, could actually change intraday because you've got people trading in and out of all the time. So more liquidity means that um, price is gonna be more realistic at any point during the day. Um, Now, the other thing that that started to emerge around this time was the demise of what's called active investing. So the idea is that previously you had some mutual funds where you had a very well-paid investment manager who was stock picking effectively. This is a type of of mutual fund. Now, as it transpired, even despite these very well-paid investment managers, you know, using their smarts to find the best stock, they actually underperformed the stock market and they've done for a while. So you're better off actually in a fund that just tracks the way that the stock market goes up, uh, a little bit like a rising tide floats or uh, or boats, rather than having a fund where there's a lot of administration fees, where you've actually got the stock picker. There's a bit of a generalization, but that's kind of really the trend we've seen. And that's kind of where exchange traded funds really started to come into their own. Many of them just track the the S&P 500 or Russell 2000. And then from that, we've just seen an explosion of investment up from about $417 billion in 2015 to $4.6 trillion globally by last year. So that's nearly a tenfold increase over kind of 15 years. Whereas, you know, mutual funds have, have gone up in terms of adoption, but nothing like that. Within each one of these, are they all made of securities, registered, approved securities? That's right, they are. And they can have different types of securities. Um, you know, some may be kind of the mainstream kind of blue chip kind of public securities. Certainly for exchange traded funds, the constituents are securities and they are operating under the 1933 Securities Act and also the Investment Company Act of 1940. So they are indeed registered and regulated. What I really want to do is I first want to talk about ETFs that include cryptocurrencies within their portfolios. Yes, let's do that. 
So when we're talking about ETFs, which have a cryptocurrency constituent, you can see kind of what, what we're trying to do here. From an institutional perspective, it's a lot easier for large institutions like pension funds and corporate organizations to invest in financial instruments that allow them to invest in a way which is very much in a wholesale way. And that means making large investments rather than kind of individual investments in, in the underlying securities. So futures, ETFs, and those types of products allow them to make these large investments. So it, with ETFs, you, you start to see institutional money flowing in to, to the arena. So that's kind of one of the reasons that, you know, ETFs that are wrapped cryptos uh, are important in the industry because it really signals the mainstream adoption by institutions rather than just kind of individuals or, you know, sort of fringe kind of VCs on, on, on the periphery. It also means that you can have a range of investments within that ETF that really kind of allows you to broaden your investment. So for example, there are ETFs that not just purely have one single product in them, but provides you with a range of investments that has exposure to crypto. So you could have an ETF that covers 30 different altcoins, for example. If one of those altcoins is unsuccessful, it's going to impact your portfolio, but it's not going to be the, the sole aspect that's going to affect your portfolio. It's going to be hedged in some kind of, uh, in some kind of way. And that hedging part is actually very important as well, because it means that those that are in institutional finance can start hedging their risk by using these products as well. So it, it's quite important for crypto and also for the institutional users of crypto that these products do start to get invented and adopted. But crypto is so volatile, right? So if you were going to have a crypto ETF or even one that had partial crypto in it. So for instance, there's this reality shares ETF trust, which is a branch of Blockhorse Capital. They pulled their filing of a proposed ETF, exchange traded fund, of which of that fund, 15% was Bitcoin and 85% were global currencies. Now, like I said, they, they pulled their filing from the SEC and we'll get into that in a moment. But if, I mean, crypto is volatile. So why would somebody, if they had a choice between a regular ETF, which did not include any crypto products, versus a crypto ETF. And I do understand that anything that has to do with stocks, bonds, anything that's securities, or even unregistered securities, it's all a big gamble. I get that. But what would make somebody choose a crypto ETF over a non-crypto ETF? So I think what's interesting about uh, crypto is that people are beginning to equate crypto with things like gold you know you should have some element of gold in your portfolio um you know people are looking at crypto as, as, as the same kind of thing you think um, you really think that is that an age thing do you think that even the uh, i don't want to say the elderly that sounds really mean i don't know people over a certain age think that or is that a younger mindset what who who's equating gold and other commodities to crypto so, for example, if you look at Grayscale Capital, uh, that's an organization that allows you to embed Bitcoin in your pension fund. So, I mean, if you're going to look at the investment profile of a millennial versus someone who's about to retire, you see kind of earlier on, you know, in your in your in your life, which I'm certainly not anymore, uh, <laughs> you see the the risk that people have in terms of risk appetite tends to be far higher earlier in their life and later in their life when they kind of need a little bit more liquidity in their portfolio. So you're seeing kind of people saying, well, you know, Bitcoin is indeed volatile. It has uh, been on an upward trajectory if you look year on year. Therefore, you know, from a long term perspective, if I was to invest in this, you know, when I'm younger in my life, then potentially if you follow that trajectory, it could be worth something. So while there's volatility in the short term, longer term, potentially there could be this upward trajectory. Now, if you have 3% in your portfolio, the, the rest of your portfolio is, is maybe a little bit more conservative with bonds or blue chip companies, then potentially, you know, that may kind of give you an exposure. So I think there's an argument to suggest that that is a, a kind of worthwhile kind of investment strategy. Not that I am qualified to give an investment advice at all, but it's something that's been considered. Now, I think this kind of equation to gold is, is a difficult one because gold certainly doesn't have the kind of volatility uh, characteristics. 
One thing that has been said that I think is very interesting is that Bitcoin and certainly these coins are non-correlated.